Church, good to be with you. Sometimes in life, it helps to know what the big picture is like. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight about biblical archaeology. Biblical archaeology started off as people who were Bible-believing, who went to the Holy Land digging, looking for particular things that they expected to find. I suppose the uh, the first person that we have recorded who did that was the mother of um, the Emperor Constantine, Helena, who in 320s AD went off to try and dig and find the locations mentioned in the Bible. Then, of course, we go through the years and we find that rich people start to travel in the 1700s and the 1800s in particular, and rich families uh, and rich gentlemen would often go off to uh, Israel and dig to try and find antiquities. Now, the name biblical archaeology might sound very um, Christian, but actually it isn't nowadays at all. It's a humanistic discipline, um, nothing to do with Christianity really, and Christianity's views are largely ignored by most biblical archaeologists, although there are a few real Christians thrown in the mix. Which gives it a bit of a problem and brings us back to the idea of the big picture. Imagine you find three pieces of a jigsaw. The trouble is you don't know how big the picture is, you don't know how many pieces they are, and not only that, you don't even know what it's a picture of. How tough would that be? Let's show you the type of thing I have in mind. So here we have three pieces. Now, of course, you can't tell something about them. You've got some colours and textures. So you might have some hints. But really, without the big picture, it's virtually impossible. You're struggling. However, if we show you the big picture first, and then you can look at the pieces and move them around and see where they fit in, and suddenly things can become very clear. The big picture is really vital for understanding how objects fit into history. And archaeology by itself doesn't give those sort of answers. It has to tie in and correlate into historical record. Now, as Christians, we believe the Bible and the Old Testament is, is, is a very precise historical record. It's amazing how many times people in the past have said, well, this person didn't exist and this person didn't exist. But biblical archaeology brings them round to show that they are real characters. And so it's an exciting journey and it's good to keep your eye on current uh, discoveries to see what... Um, what light it throws. There's been some amazing finds over the years. Of course, the, the, the biggest, the most exotic was the Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1947-48. But I don't know whether you're aware that there have been more recent finds of the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. We have reliefs from palaces. So, for example, this one is the king putting out the eyes of a prisoner. And, of course, that's exactly what happens to the last king of Israel when he's carted off into captivity. And this relief here from the wall of a palace actually shows the children of Israel being carried away and even objects from the temple included. Amazing finds that prove the Bible is correct. But even in this last year, there's been some amazing finds as well. Here we have the... Um, the palace, of one of the palaces of Herod. And this is the place where John the Baptist was held captive. And if you look at the top right-hand corner, you'll see an open courtyard. And they've now examined that on a dig. And they can show that that is the place where Salome would have danced for Herod and ordered the head of John the Baptist to be presented to her on a plate. Amazing. Amazing to think you can go around Israel and these locations are alive. How about this? this? This has been discovered just recently and it actually is a ring that mentions the name Pilate. Now the newspapers, of course, were very keen to sort of 
put the idea together this was Pilate's own ring. It probably wasn't. It's a cheaper type of material than a Roman governor would wear. But it certainly would be a ring from somebody in his household with some symbol of authority. And it's a fabulous find. Because for years again, people said that Pilate didn't exist until they found an inscription in Rome. And then this inscription on this ring in Israel found in the last few years. How about this? This is a seal from King Hezekiah, mentioned, of course, in the scriptures. And this one is actually mentions the name Isaiah from the court of King Hezekiah, who was a member of the royal family in his own right and had his own seal and ring. I think we've all heard a lot about the purple cloth recently, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I did a podcast on it not so long ago. So if you want to have a look at that, but this is the actual material that they found the purple dye. And this uh, is one of the um, the latest Dead Sea Scroll finds. There's been new Dead Sea Scrolls found in recent years. And now they just begin to be translated. It's an absolute treasure trove of new material, hundreds and hundreds of documents, all buried before the rebellion of AD 70. So all of these documents from the life and times of Jesus. Amazing. But when you consider these uh, new reports, they're often an analysis of things that have been discovered a few years ago. What, what I'm saying here is you might discover Pilate's ring, but you don't immediately know what it is. It takes years of analysis and cleaning and documentation before you suddenly realise what the object is. And so there's a vast amount of material that's been pulled out of the ground and, and really still being analysed and discussed today. Let me just put this in context for you. Because the whole vastness of what's already been discovered has to be set against this background. The largest area that Israel ever ruled was from the Nile in the south to the Euphrates River in the north above Syria. But only half that land from the reign of Solomon is in the hands of Israel today. And Israel today is very divided, as you know, politically. And not everywhere is possible to get the digs where you want them to be. Only 1% of Israel has been surveyed for archaeological digs. Only 1% has been surveyed. And of that, only 1% has been excavated. And of that which has been excavated, only a small percentage has been documented and analysed. And of that, only a small percentage has been reported. And for all those documents that have been reported in academic review magazines, only a very small percentage of that gets into the public arena. And yet, and yet, we have that vastness of treasure trove that we're aware of. How many more amazing finds will be found in the years to come? One last point, and then we'll finish. Just one last point. The king's seal, like that of Hezekiah, was used to mark and seal his own property. It wasn't very large. It was only about a centimetre, but it was a seal that could be wired and put in place around a box or around goods to make sure that the ownership of the property was seen to be the king's. And what's more, you could only open the box or whatever it was by breaking the seal. So it was a guarantee that it was intact. It brings to mind something that Paul says to the Church of Corinth. And I suppose it's good to look at where Corinth is. Corinth is the narrow part of land that sort of joins where Athens is down to where Sparta is below. And at its narrowest point, it is only a few mile across, as you can see from this map. 
Now today, it's a, now actually a canal. It, it's that short a piece of land that they turned it into a canal. But of once upon a time, it was just land. And in ancient times, rather than sail right around the whole bottom of Greece, they used to come and land their ship at uh, Sencre and then carry the goods overland to uh, Lechium. And they would do that by unloading all of the ship's cargo, putting them in boxes and rollers and literally roll them across the land and load them in the ship at the other side. And the ship's agent would travel from one port to the other with his manifest and he would look at every box that was loaded and check the seal was in place. And that gives rise to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and has put his seal upon us and given us his spirit, his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. When we become a Christian, God gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal, marking us as his property, property that nobody else is allowed to interfere with. And believe me, he polices that rigorously. God has sealed us and given us the Holy Spirit as a down payment of heaven and what is to come. Thank God. Bless his name. The big picture is something that's vital, not just for historians, but vital for us to find our own place in life. Without the big picture, sometimes the pieces don't make sense at all. But in God, once we see what that picture is, life can truly make sense. God bless you.